The whole end has seen its fair share of iconic moments over the years. Phil King's penalty against Inter Milan, Kent Nielsen's thunderbolt against Inter Milan, Dean Saunders' stunner against Ipswich, Stan Collymore's goal versus Atletico Madrid ripping the roof off the stadium. Andy Vyman held his arms aloft, Alan Hutton made us rise, we supported Stan Petrov. Gabby against the Blues, 5-1. John Carew also picked up a ball boy during that game. Gabby against the Blues again, 1-0. Gary Cahill's overhead kick. Benteke in the dying moments against QPR and West Brom. Tim Sherwood showing off his ice cold veins. John begins worldy volley in off the crossbar. Albert Adoma standing in front of it like a king. Connor Harahan's rocket saw lift off in the playoff semi-final. Ezri Concer's vital 95th minute winner against Watford. <laughs> Wait, let me do that again. Tara Mings's vital 95th minute winner against Watford. We've seen it packed to the rafters we've seen it eerily empty and an empty hole and just feels wrong our manager's father was a steward there we've seen heroes become villains joy and despair we've hung banners welcome managers we've turned on managers we've sung and danced and hugged and kissed strangers celebrating all manner of goals there the left side the right side the whole tent villa park's famous stand So I sit in the hole and a lot stands out about it, how it rises up out the pitch, the brickwork, the mosaic, you know, the, the, the whole form of the thing. But one thing stands out above all, and that's the name. Stands are usually named after club legends, uh, heroes, sponsors, players, anything. Um, but no Holt has ever stood out for the Villa over the years. Uh, what's the connection? There's no Holt wearing claret and blue. So we asked Rob Bishop to explain actually where the Holt got its famous name and we spoke to a handful of former Villa heroes to find out what it's like to play in front of the Holt end. The Holt end, yes, well that's, that's all down to a gentleman called Thomas Holt, who I think may have become Sir Thomas Holt uh, and uh, he was born late 1500s and in the early 1600s he was responsible for building Aston Hall, um, which obviously overlooks Villa Park and also the Holt Hotel was built on the similar sort of location on the corner there. And I just think it's in the same way that the Witten End is because it's, although it's now the North Stand, the Witten End was would, because it's near Witten, in Witten Island, that was near the, the area associated with Thomas Holt. Um, so I think it's as simple as that, it's just named after him, fantastic atmosphere on there and the, you know that's where most of the noise is generated but when it was a terrace and it was, it was towards 29,000 un absolutely unbelievable um, even on the by the time they'd, they'd started to uh, restrict numbers I think there were 19,000 uh, on for the final time against Liverpool uh, when they, they won 2-1 after going a goal down um, and Dwight York scored two goals at that end in the second half. And somewhere, I think I've still got, and I'm sure thousands of others have still got one, not that I was on there that day, I was working, but there was a certificate from the mail to say, I stood on the Holt end when it was a terrace for the last time. So it was, you know, it was a very, or well, still is a very special place. When you were a fan at Villa Park, would the Holt have been where you'd have watched games from? Yeah. Yeah, I, I first I first went up onto the Holt when because uh, I, I I couldn't afford to go to games, so um, you know me and a few of my mates had when they'd let you in like 10, 15 minutes before the game when people were leaving, we used to go in and catch the last the last ten fifteen minutes, and um, yeah, when it, I just remember used to I used to watch Gordon Cowens all the time, and the pace just looked so quick, you know, because I was only playing. Um, Sunday football then as a kid and stuff and you just used to look at the the players and think they were massive and they, were, they just looked really really quick and the ball used to just zip so nicely on the turf and and I used to love I used to love going down for those last 10-15 minutes and, 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 and watching but then as I, as I got older I used to start going to midweek games because I couldn't really go on a weekend because I was playing playing football so the midweek games was when I could go, um, but it was just uh, 
as soon as I went, I'm sure the same with you and, and a lot of fans, as soon as you go in, it's like a whole new place and a whole different atmosphere than anywhere you've ever been before. And just loved it. Just loved it. It's a cliche, isn't it? But it, it's like going into that, entering into that magical land in it and you've, you've step up, especially in the midweeks, floodlights, the green, yeah. the green pitch. Where, where would you have used to have stood? Towers, left side, right side? Left, up the back. Um, and I always used to go where one of the bloody bars were and get smashed every time we scored <laughs> because because I, I could lean on it. I could see. I could see. So um, yeah, it's it's a, it's a shame it had to go see Tim, but it's the way the way of the world, isn't it? But the atmosphere. I mean, the the best game I ever went to for atmosphere was the Bar- Barcelona game. Where we beat them for, it was three 0 I think, at Villa Park, and we absolutely smashed them. And but the atmosphere that night, I had no voice left. I just remember having no voice left um, the next day because of the the singing that went on that night. Unbelievable, best game I've ever been to. What's that like then when you experience the kind of adulation from from the Holt end? You know, you're playing in front of a, of a packed Holt end and. They're feeding off you. You're feeding off them. Obviously, we only see it. We only see it from sitting in the stands. What's it like from the other side? Well, I, I loved it. I always had done. I, I, you know, the bigger the crowd, the better. The the more things that I would try to do, the more times I'd flick the ball over my head or nutmeg somebody or, or you know, I, I did things then that, like I say, you know, you you know, people like Ron Saunders used to pull. Well, he didn't have much hair, but he he pulled it out if he if he'd had any with me. I just to do things. I, I, I just wanted to try things. I just wanted to do things. I just wanted to, you know, he used to tell me to blast the ball in the goal, but I, I used to just sort of ping it in the corner or bend it round. Or I, I just loved it. And I just loved the fact that, um, I, I just loved the fact that I could do it at the time. You know I mean? I, I, and it was a tough game then. I got kicked a lot. You know, I used to, I used to get kicked a lot and people who I played against used to say to me, I'm going to have you today, son, don't worry, I'm going to kick you. And I used to say, well, make sure you kick me in the box because I'll get a penalty then and things like that, you know. So, um, and I don't know, it was a different era completely. But I, I loved, I loved that, that's, that, that was the time when the other side of me, that real uh, show, if you can call it, if it's showy off, yeah, I don't know. If it, if, but I, I, I certainly like to, to, to show what I could do on a football field. Um, and sometimes it didn't come off, um, but I, I'd, I'd never stopped trying to do things. I'd never, I don't think I did too many things that were easy. And um, it, it was the Saturday or the match day that I lived for all the time. Um, uh, so I, it, it, it was just for me, um, not not listening to the crowd singing your name or anything like that. Just just the the whole atmosphere, just the whole. I, I've said it to people all my life. You know, the football field's a stage, and when you're on that stage, act act. Show them what you've got. Act it out. You know, be be what you want to be. Um, uh, you know, I, so for me, that was that was what it was all about. You know, it was all about the stage. I'm going on the stage. I'm going to perform on the stage. I want to show people what I can do. And I don't care if I'm showing off because afterwards I would walk and I wouldn't really say very much. I wasn't, I wasn't, wasn't really a loud person at all. Um, I was very opinionated. If I was asked, I would give an opinion. But I, I pretty much kept myself to myself, really. You forgive my ignorance, Froggy. I would have been on the whole end that day against Palace. I can't remember your goal. Can you? Yes, like like it was yesterday. Honestly, uh, I think I think it was I think it was Dino actually. No, not Dino. Sorry, it was. Um... Might have been Ray Houghton or somebody else. Well, it's a midfielder. They they lobbed it into the penalty area and it came back off the crossbar. And it and I was I was running onto the ball and it bounced quite high. And I I kind of did an acrobatic flip and smashed it into the into the corner. And that was my first goal. Talk about the best feeling ever as a as a young lad to actually score an acrobatic goal in front of the whole ten. I mean, it, it literally was the stuff that dreams are made of. It was just such an amazing thing to happen. I know it's easy to kind of lurch into kind of cliche territory when we're talking about it, but it must be like something. It's like a kind of moving mass of humanity, isn't it? Especially back then oh, when it was a standing terrace. I, I'm not ashamed to say this. Uh, Villa Park has, will and always will be my favourite football ground in any one I've been in the country. And the reason I love it so much is is the architecture, the fact it, it's one of the last remaining 
unique older grounds that's modernized and still looks magnificent but but the atmosphere i mean the atmosphere in there if as a player when i went on there, especially as a winger because you, you sort of you, you can hear you can hear it crackle from the sides and you, we'll go on to the liverpool game i guess in a minute but the, the, the ground is one of my favorite places ever so much so i mean i, I think you do know this but um, I spread my dad's ashes on the Holt end when he passed away 20 years ago. So that's the affinity that myself and my dad had had with the football club and obviously with the ground. So by the time you were at Villa, it's been knocked down, hasn't it, in terms of the yeah. standing terrace? By the time you signed for Villa, and it's um, it's a it's a seated seated stand. What was what was that moment like? The first time that you scored in front of the Holt? Poor. Oh. People ask me what what my best my best goal is for for Villa, um, and you know they always say is it the cup final goal? But I always say it's the first goal at Villa Park because it was one of those where I was Brian Little's first signing. It's for a number of reasons, really. Brian Little's first signing, and a lot of people were thinking, yeah, this Ian Taylor is is a brummy like, but. Is he good? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So, but so I felt a bit of pressure when I signed um, because nobody nobody knew who I was or anything. But you know, obviously Brian had done his own work. He knew he tried to sign me before when he was at Leicester, I think, and um, and I turned him down. But when I got, became available again, he, he he came in for me again, and and I, and I saw and because obviously because it was Villa, I wanted to sign. So that night, we, yeah, I played against Arsenal in my on my debut, and we drew nil nil. And then obviously the home game was um, against Chelsea, my first home game, and and to score in front of the whole team, like I think it was near near the end as well. Um, just managed to get in the box on end of Dwight's cross, I think, and um, and get my head on it, and you know just all that. It was just massive relief and um, an emotion because all my, you know, we, we talked about tickets before and getting tickets for games. Bloody hell. The amount of tickets I had to get for that game as well because all my mates and all my family were there and and standing on the whole end and, and to do it there and to score there was just something else. I'm getting all emotional now about it. <laughs> <laughs> the one that most fans will probably see as well was the win against Man City. Obviously, when then when there's a picture of me in front of the whole end celebrating again, that I'll never forget that that picture. I can't get out of my head. Obviously, thinking about it. Have you got Have you got a copy of that picture? It was the winner, wasn't it? I think I remember. Um, yeah, it was. Yeah, being boot up by Guzan and it was helped, and I think by Kozak potentially. And it seemed to take ages to get. The, you just had the slightest of touches, and it rolled it past Joe Hart. And you were the. I think you were the only person in the ground who was convinced it was going to go in because you ran away to celebrate before it crossed the line. Obviously, I seen the yeah, Joe Hart came out, and I just tried to flick it past him and then tap it in the net. But obviously, got. A, bigger touch on it than I thought I would. Um, yeah, I kind of chased after it for a few yards and then I seen the defender and I thought, he's not getting there. And then, yeah, I thought, that, he, that's going in. And then obviously, yeah, I just set off celebrating. And even then, I think there's that picture. And then, like, I turned around and there's no one there because I was obviously so far ahead of everyone. And then to kind of turn back to the crowd and then it took a few seconds for everyone to, like, to, to come come to me to celebrate. But, yeah, that was a that was a great day. Tell us what that feels like because, you know, I've been on, on that from the other side, been in the whole end at moments like that. But to actually be the, the man who kind of is at the centre of that, what what does that feel? Do you feel like you're kind of floating off the ground? Or Yeah, it's, it's a surreal feeling. I think obviously that in that picture as well, it, what's so good about it, I think you can see the expressions in all the fans. Obviously, you see me from behind, but the, the fans, you see how much it means to them. And when you stand there and look at the crowd and you see about, I don't know, how many fit in the whole end, like 3,000, 4,000 people right in front of you and you see them all going crazy. I think there's no there's no better feeling in the world. Talking specifically about the whole thing, can you feel this kind of big mass, this yeah. heaving mass of humanity? Does it, is it intimidating or is it 
No, I think when, especially when it was, especially when it was all standing, you know, when it was all standing there and the goal went in and you could just, you, f you saw the waves of people waving down because they almost fall on each other, don't they, those days? The, it's like this the massive wave coming down the fans as a as a goal goes in, you know, it was just, just great to see, you know, it was just something that went on in the time and, you know, some of the songs they sang, you know, they, they almost waved like, like the sea to each other. It was just incredible, really. Um so you know, prior to the the seating, it, it, it was different again because they created something that was uh, not only vocal but visual. You know that 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 was the way I would explain it. It was like almost watching the sea flow in and out when the when they were rolling around with each other. So it was really uh, it was really really sort of inspirational, really to to be part of it and to 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 listen to it and to see it um, and to play on the pitch. You know, there were there were certain grounds that were just great to be at, and Villa Park was was very much one of the the, the best ones to be at, sort of thing. I know this sounds an obvious question, Tars, but what does it feel? What does it look like? Because you, you're standing there, you've just scored a goal, the net's rippled. You're standing there, and you're either throwing yourself into the crowd and being hugged by the people on the first, on the first couple of rows, or you're kind of standing there giving it like the arms aloft and, and basking in it. What do you actually see? Or don't, don't you see? Do you just zone out? Or? Zone out, mate. You absolutely zone out. I think for a few seconds after you do score, you absolutely zone out. But then you kind of realise, yeah, what am I going to do now kind of thing. And um, I just went on. I think cause I've seen it that many times back now. I just went off to the corner, near the corner flag and just did a knee slide. And then before I knew it, I think Ray Outen was jumping on me and a few others. And But then you just think, yes. Um, and I, I think I turned to the whole 10 because I knew my mates were up there and I just put my arms in the air and um, and that was it. Because obviously you're, you're looking, but you don't see anybody, if you know what I mean. You just see crowd and you, you can't pick faces out or anything. You just see crowd and... Um, it was just massive, massive happiness and relief. And uh, it's hard to describe. I'm, I'm sure many a footballers try to describe what it's like to score a goal. And it's it's really, really difficult. Could you re revisit that in your mind's eye? If you're having a bad day for whatever reason and you, you need something to pick you up a little bit, could you put yourself back into that kind of place and just close your eyes and think... No, nah, it's impossible, mate. It's, imp it's impossible. And I mean, that that is, um, you know... People ask me the question, you know, do you miss anything about football? And it's scoring goals, scoring goals in front of a crowd because um, you'll never, ever get that feeling again. So, um, you know, in general, I don't really miss playing that much, but to score a goal in front of, in front of your own fans and just to see the happiness that it gives people is just something else, something else, and you can never replace that. Our stadium always used to be so immaculate. Uh, everything about it, um, you know, if if a coat hook came off in the dressing room on on a Saturday afternoon, by by Sunday morning it had been replaced, it had been fixed. You know, everything about that club, and and you look at it now, and it's just it's such an amazing place. You know, I hope that it will continue to to uh to to stay as it is you know it doesn't need you don't need to change any of the stands or um i know there's, there's talk about maybe changing the north stand but don't take away don't take away the beauty of the place because it's a it, it's a place of beauty as well it's actually a beautiful old stadium uh, and it's exceptionally well man maintained and um uh i'm i would just be glad when uh, when obviously the fans can can go back and uh, fill up all those empty seats again and uh, get the place rocking, mate. I've been there when it's been rocking and uh, it, it's an awful, awesome place to, to be um, when, when everything's going well. So um, hopefully that will happen very soon, Matt. Thank you for listening to Claret and Blue, an Aston Villa podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please let us know. We love hearing your feedback. We'll be back soon with another episode. Until then, up the villa.